Acts chapter 4, verse 33. Acts 4, 33. I just like the scripture. And then we'll start from there. The Bible says, and with great power. Now, at the back of your mind, just have this at the back of your mind. As I'm saying, flowing in the grace of God, you can just have, you know, in parentheses, uh, you know, power. So, flowing in the grace and the power of God. The Bible says, and with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. The apostles. Great power gave witness because great grace was upon them. What we can achieve and the things we are able to do with the grace of God is unfathomable. What we can achieve, what we can do with the grace of God. Great grace was upon the apostles. And because of great grace, they operated with great power. But today I want to start. How, how, what can I... Now, there's a question I've always asked the Lord and to be sincere. Because I've studied grace, many times I've read through it, I keep asking God simple question, which is this. Lord, if you've done everything, if you believe Jesus has done everything, say yes. Yeah. If you've done everything, if I couldn't do anything, I couldn't anything, I can't do anything. If you've done everything, what is it that I have to do? Maybe today or next week. Some people walked to Jesus and they said to Jesus, I think we'll read it later, said, what is the work of God? And Jesus says, this is the work of God that you believe. And I said, okay, God. Since many people also say they believe. What is it? Listen carefully. Why is it? That if the same great grace is in this place, why is it possible for some people to manifest grace? Maybe in one area of their lives more than other people. Is that true? Are there people who manifest grace in their marriage? That you see their marriage is just too good to be true. Are there people who manifest grace in their career, their vocation or profession? That you, why is it easy for them? Are there people who manifest grace in counseling, in, in, in speaking words of wisdom? And you wonder why is it easy? Are there people who manifest so much great grace in their talents or in the things they do, maybe as I'm preaching today, and you're wondering why is it so easy for these people? Why is it that if that person goes on the keyboard, why is it that if that person sings, it's just something different? But this grace is for all of us. I don't know whether I ask such questions. I don't just dismiss things and just say, oh, I don't know what they are doing. No, 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 no. I want to know why. And I want to share with us some of these simple things that you already, you are aware of these things. But I want you to be conscious of these things and to begin to tell yourself, I want to do this. I want to be like this. So that the will of God be established in my life. In my life. All that as Christians, we would learn to rest in God. Rest in God. So that we can flow in this grace. All that we, we could rest in him. Completely rest in God. 
Maybe sometimes we're too interested in making a point that we forgo of taking advantage of the blessing that God has provided for us. Maybe we're too interested in showing our skill, in showing our intelligence, in showing how smart we are. We're too intelligent. We're too conscious of showing what we could do that we forgo of what God is able to do for us. The apostles, the great power, the witness for great grace was upon them. They did not witness with great power because they were intelligent, they were smart. It was, no, 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 because great grace was upon them. Our God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good, healing them that were oppressed of the devil, not because he was intelligent, not because he was smart. The Bible didn't say all of that. The Bible said, for God was with him. Moses found grace. But how? He said, if you will not follow, I will not go. So, I believe that it is possible for each and every one of us to flow in this grace of God in all areas of our lives. Maybe there's an area of my life that I'm struggling presently. It is possible to flow in the grace of God. It is possible. It is possible. It is possible. But I pray that the Holy Spirit will open our eyes of understanding and break through stony hearts so that our hearts become like flesh so that we can genuinely receive the truth of the word of God that will launch us into that position where we can effortlessly flow in the grace of God and not in our own power. How can we bring glory to God if we don't flow in the grace that is provided? How can I live a life of power like the apostles and produce divine results? How can someone do great exploits for God without the empowerment of God? How can if the results you want to generate must be divine, then you require divine assistance. No, 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 no. If you want to generate human results, you need human help. But if you want to generate divine results, you need divine assistance. Because the input is important. Now, Mary, Mary said, how can it be saying that I know no man? And the Bible says, listen to this, why you don't need a man is because the result is not a man's result. He said, the power of God will come over you. The, the power of God will overshadow you. You see, he said, because that which will be born of you is the son of God. That if I want the son of man, if, if I need Joseph to have a son, that is a different ball game. But this one is different. And because it is different, we start from the impute. It's very important for us to understand that results can come in many ways. But not all good results in the eyes of man are God's results. And if I'm interested in that kind of result, impute, it's important. You see, because the impute determines the essence of the output. When I say the essence of the output, the makeup of the output. Does that, does that make any sense to us? If you want to, if you want to, if you want to, I don't know, if you want to bake cake, then use flour. If you change that impute, what you have is not cake. The impute determines the essence of the output. Not just how you know you can do something that looks like cake. You can do something like look, you can use Gary to do a shape of cake and put ice cream on it. And put cream on it. Hey man. You can you can put your pounded yam or whatever you want to do. You can even do rice and cook it so 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 soft and mold it and put cream on it. And then somebody can come here and put a knife through it and cut it and be happy and take pictures. But we know. Look at some other person, we know. That does it is not cake. Why is it not cake? Because we, from the beginning, the impute cannot produce cake. Anybody here want God's results? Then you ask yourself, what's the impute? 
I want to lead praise worship, but I want God's result. What's the impute? I want to show us, just equip us. That's my assignment. That's my work. That's why I'm here. With the things that God wants us to do. Let me say this. I've told us that whole how we could rest. But another thing I want to say in passing, and then we'll break some things down, is if we do not empty ourselves, how can God fill us up? In a great house, there are vessels unto honor and there are vessels unto dishonor. If a man, you see, listen to this. Like, I want to say something, and you need to take this very, very carefully. God doesn't single handedly determine our results. God doesn't only own fullness as in 100% determines our result. No. Because if God does that, then he has to do for A what he's done for B. But God has provided each and every one of us the same grace sufficient for the fulfillment of our purpose. Does that make sense? So the meaning of that is this. The output of your life is not dependent on what God does, but it depends on what you do with what God has done. Why? Because what God has done is not a variable. Uh, uh, but what you do with what God has done is the variable. Does that make sense? It's not sounding too much like mathematics. You see, because what God has done is constant. And once it's a constant, it does not determine the output. Only variables determine the output. But because God has done everything, it doesn't determine the output. It's what you do with what he has done that determines your output. Because he's constant. He's God all by himself. He's done all that he needs to do. What I do with what he's done, how I respond to what he's done, is what determines the output. I'll give you an example. If your, if your equation is two plus k equals to 5. Then k now is the variable because 2 is 2. I'll teach you a bit of math. Now, 2 is 2. So, it's 2 plus k. k is a constant. Don't think about plan constant, all right? Just k. And then it equals to 5. Now, this is the question. You can't change 2 because it's 2. But you see, what you do with k determines your output. Your k can be 1. Your k can be, let's say, equals to dash. Equals to whatever you like. So if your k is 1, 2 plus 1 equals 2. If your k is 1 million, 2 plus 1 million equals 2. If your k is 1 billion, 2 plus 1 billion equals 2. You see, what determines the output is the variable you put into it. Are you following what I'm trying to say now? God is a faithful God that can't change. What can change is whether you believe that he is a faithful God or not. <laughs> the variable is the extent to which you believe that he is a faithful God. That's the variable. So some people believe to that extent, some people believe to that extent. I want you to follow me. Let's read Philippians and then we'll say one or two things before we close today. Philippians chapter 2, 5 to 11. Let this mind, everybody say this mind. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. As for those who prefer Jesus Christ to Christ Jesus, Christ Jesus to Jesus Christ. I know some of you don't understand. Who being in the form of God 
did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Verse 9. Everybody say, great grace. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him. Did he do something? Yeah. Ah, follow me. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that are the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and those under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's start with this thought. This is, most of these things we'll be talking today will be referring to Jesus. How Jesus, how many people believe that Jesus flowed in the grace of God? And I want to show you some of the stuff that he did that made it easy for him. And then we're going to look at other characters in the Bible with examples. I think I'm going to share about five or six thoughts in total with us. The first thing that I want to share with us, if you want to write this now, we must embrace the knowledge of the truth. We must embrace. We must love it. We must <laughs> we must embrace the knowledge of the truth. We must embrace it. We must seek the knowledge of the truth. We must do everything. We, we must embrace the knowledge of the truth. Very, very important. Very, very important. Second, Second Peter chapter 1 verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ. Do you want to flow in grace and flow in more grace? You need the knowledge of the truth. Flowing in the grace of God. Flowing in more grace. You need the knowledge of the truth. Grace and peace be multiplied. Fridays ago, we were told this. It multiplies. It grows. It increases. It's everywhere in the Bible. Grace and peace be multiplied. So, how do I flow in grace and flow in more grace? It says it will be multiplied through knowledge. But I want to say something here that is very important. It says through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ. Does that sound like John chapter 17 verse 3? And this is eternal life. That they will know you the only true God. And Jesus Christ whom you are saved. Does that sound the same? And his divine power. Now, he's telling us what to know. Follow me closely. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus, our Lord. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. By which we have been given, which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of divine nature, having escaped the corruption that it is in the world through lust. Now, verse three downward through to four is telling us the things that we need to know. He says you need to know this as is divine power. Has given to us all things. Knowledge. So the question you need to ask yourself if you want to flow in the grace of God is what is the content of your knowledge? What do you know? See, that's why sometimes in Christianity we have built up, you know, a, 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 a form of godliness that has no power. The Bible says some have it the form of godliness but denying the power thereof. Because what you know, it's important. The 
content of what you know is important if you want to flow in the grace of God. And I, I submit to you that sometimes what we know or what people are taught cannot allow them to flow in the grace of God. It actually makes life more difficult. What you know? Knowledge of the truth. Knowledge of what God has done for us. Knowledge of the riches of our new life in Christ. These are the things you need to know. Knowledge of the... The Bible says divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. He has called us by glory and virtue. He has given to us exceeding great and precious promises. We are partakers of his divine nature. We have escaped corruption that is in the world through lust. Wow. His divine power has given to me all things that pertain to life and godliness. It's important for you. This is how to flow in the grace of God. This is how grace becomes multiplied. His divine power has given to me. He's not going to give it to me. His divine power has given to me all things that pertain to life and godliness. The question is not whether I am able to do it or not. The question is whether God has done it or not. And you see, I pray that somebody will receive this. You don't want your life to be full of struggle. Everything is struggle. Everything. As you are in church, you are thinking about your finances. Debt everywhere. You're thinking about your career. You've struggled for years and years. You don't even know you are. You're thinking about your office because nobody likes you in the office. Say, because I'm a Christian. That's not true. Look at proper Christian in the Bible. They're not, they're not disliked because of their excellence. They are always disliked because of their moral framework. That's why you talk about people like Joseph. You know, Joseph was excellent in all things. Such that even the person that worked with Joseph put everything in his hand. The only hatred that he has, he has because he will not backslide. The Bible says if you're persecuted for Christ's sake, he didn't say if you're persecuted because you don't know your job. Grace. I pray that as we continue with this, you will find this grace on your job. I'm telling you, you will find this grace on your job. You will find this grace on your job. Your, your, your delivery will be different from everybody. The way you carry out stuff will be different. Not as in arrogance, not as in proving a point, but as in operating by the grace of God. Not as in showing off. Because a mindset to show off shuts you off from flowing in that grace. Like one of the things that we shared in our men's retreat, if you're going to show up in your name, you've already marked your own script. Because your whole entire judgment and result will be tied to your ability. But when you show up in the name of the Almighty God, John chapter 8, verse 31, 32. Jesus said to those Jews who believed him. Who believed him. And I'm talking to you now because I know you believe Jesus. You believe Jesus, but it didn't stop there. He said he told those who believed him. Because you see, there were times Jesus spoke to those who didn't believe. There were times that he would speak to Pharisees. Woe to you Pharisees. Woe to you. There are those times. But this time now, he said to those Jews who believed in him, if you abide in my word, and uh, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The more you know, and as you do, the greater your experience of all the blessings of the cross. The more, that's why grace and peace be multiplied to you. The more you know, the more you know and observe to do according to that which you know, for Jesus said, that a man who hears the word and doeth it not is like a man who built his house on the sand. And the winds and the torment of this world come and it sweeps the house away. 
But he that is wise is he that heareth the word and will do the word. For he is a wise man who has built his house upon the rock. And when the turbulence and all the problem of life comes, blows and blows and blows and blows and they end, I will keep on standing. The truth. Grace and peace be multiplied as you know. Second Peter 3, 17 to 18. You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness. Beloved, Beware lest you fall from your own steadfastness. Now, I can stay on that for many years. I don't know. Do you know you can believe in God and be beloved and fall from your steadfastness? You can fall from your steadfastness. You can fall from your, your, your passion and, 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 and commitment to God. You can fall. You know how you fall? Being led away by the error of the wicked. Fall from your steadfastness. You are always eager for God. Let's go for it. Let's do it. Let's do it. But then there are those who are wicked, full of error. By the time they intervene with your life, you fall from your steadfastness. You now say, hey, you can save God in your heart. It doesn't really matter. Well, prayer. But, hey, no, even if you don't pray, God answers prayer. They say, it's not true. It's not, <laughs> it's not true. This Bible, we have read it before. From Genesis to Revelation, I've read 20 times. Yes, that was the day you were steadfast. But why are you falling from that? That's why Paul will look at the Galatians and say, who has bewitched you, who has deceived you, in order was the wicked one. Jesus said, why men slept. Not physical sleep. When men slept, the evil one comes and plants something. If you want to flow in the grace of God, listen carefully. That's not where I'm going. I'm just, I don't even know why I'm saying this. If you want to flow in the grace of God, please shut the door against the error of the wicked. People who come, how do they come? They come with words. They come with advice. They come with, have you not seen? They come with, has these things really worked for you? They come with, don't listen to them. They come with, I have been there before. They come with, I have a lot of experience. The error of the wicked. But he said, instead, grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let your focus be Christ in the knowledge, instead that's the word of birth, that's what it means, instead he says, you therefore below since you know before, and you can read before that because we don't have, you know, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness this is painful, these guys were below, these guys, beware so that you don't fall from your own steadfastness Beware so that you don't fall from that's your prayer. Your, that's your Bible study. That's your passion for God. That's ready, go. Let's do it now. Be, be, beware. It says, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. To win be the glory, but now and forever. To him. Growing, you want to flow. We're talking about flowing in the grace of God. Flowing in the grace of God can never be separated from growing in knowledge. Growing in the grace of God and growing in the knowledge of the truth are inseparable. And that's why what those who are given to this knowledge, to seek knowledge, they will grow in grace. No, they, they might not necessarily be praying, God, increase my grace. No, they are multiply in grace as they obey God to seek knowledge. It's a grow in grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to this. There are so many things you can grow on. There are so many things you can know. But most knowledge, all of those other knowledge, they do increase the grace of God. It's the knowledge of the truth. The knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The knowledge of the word of God. You grow in grace. So maybe it is time, my brothers and my sisters, to pick your Bible up. Maybe it is time to begin to read it like never before. 
Maybe it is time to set yourself new targets that I want to discover more of God. Maybe it's the time for you to understand that Christianity is a personal stuff. That the entire assignment of a pastor is to equip you for the work of ministry, not to do it for you. Some of the lies that we've been told. Let me fast for you for 21 days. Lying Satan. To equip you. Let me turn to your neighbor. Tell the person, please look for your Bible. Some people get to look for their Bible. It's hiding. You can forget your Bible in church for two months. You won't even know you've forgotten it. We see it. Don't worry. Ask the ushers. We know you, but you don't know. Because we see your Bible in church for three months. Your name on it. You haven't even looked for it. Uh, just you've not read it for three months. Full stop. He said, we've been reading it on your phone. All right. I believe. That's what they all say. Please turn to your neighbor. Tell the person, please read the Bible. Please find out for yourself. Tell that person, God loves you exactly the way he loves me. And then I share this. They're very related. Number two. Very related. We must believe and trust in the finished work of Christ. The first one, we must embrace the knowledge of the truth. But now, very similar, we must believe and trust in the finished work of Christ. This is a major one. <laughs> John chapter 19, I'll read from 28. After this, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished, Accomplished. Everybody say done. Say everything has been done. <laughs> After this, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled. He said he was thirsty. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there and they filled the sponge with sour wine, put it on his soap, and put it on his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished. It is an insult to think that Jesus came to this world to do half job. It is an insult to think that Jesus came to earth, left the throne, brought himself down, who being in the very nature of God, consider it not robbery, didn't grasp that, but became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. It is an insult for anybody to preach a gospel that suggests that Jesus did half work. And I tell you how people preach such. People preach such when they tell you that if you don't do this and do this, you can never be saved. People do that when they tell you that your works are necessary for you to have salvation. Let me tell you something. I'm going to do a series on that. You see, your works are not pre-salvation. They are post-salvation. Because every pre-work, pre-salvation work cannot take you to heaven. But you see, your works must be post-salvation as a proof that indeed you are regenerated. So therefore also, someone cannot say they are saved and we can't see works. Do you understand what I mean? Pre-salvation works is useless. It's good for people to say you are a good man. But good man that we end in end fire. Okay? Post-salvation works, it's a proof that you are genuinely regenerated. Because you cannot be thoroughly regenerated and it does not produce the fruit. For by their fruit we shall know them. So the only way we can know that you are saved, is it, but people don't need to know you are lying. Tear your Bible and tear it out of it. But for Jesus made it clear 
that by their fruit we shall know. He said, by your fruit, the people will know you are my disciples. How many times does the Bible say, if you abide in me, you will bear fruit. Listen carefully to this. Works are essential to Christianity, but they are not pre-salvation. They are post-salvation. And a proof that we are completely regenerated. And that which we now do, we do by the power of the Most High God. So we can say, therefore, that works is not necessary. No, works are necessary. Works are not necessary to secure, but they are necessary for you to know you are properly saved. We, we, we need to know. You say, I've been born again, I'm regenerated. Everybody you see, you abuse them. You continue in persistently, you continue persistently and consistently in slandering and gossip. Uh -uh, uh -uh. The Bible says that the source of water, you can all have fresh and salty water from the same source. These are deep stuff. So the question you now begin to ask yourself is that what is my source? If effortlessly I can deliver venom, effortlessly you can deliver venom. You don't need to think twice before you slander people. Effortlessly you can deliver venom. It cannot be by the Spirit of God, please. Listen to this. The Bible says that his born of God does not practice sin. In other words, you can make a mistake. It can slip out of your mouth one day. You know, you are a fresh water and somebody went to Atlantic Ocean and poured a cup inside the fresh water. You know, for a bit, there will be salt water inside the fresh water. For a bit. But for how long? It will be insignificant. It's not going to be consistent. And what I always tell people is this. If you can deliver venom and evil consistently, you need to sit down and talk to God. Are you, are we, are we, no, no, worry. Uh, we're going to explore that completely. It is finished, Jesus said. It is essential to trust fully on the finished work of Christ. Look at somebody, tell the person, Christ is enough for me. Tell the person, Christ is more than enough. It's more than enough. It's more than enough. It's more than enough. Oh, listen carefully to this. Don't get me wrong. It is not a sin to come to church and you have man to. It's not a sin. Maybe for some it's, it's a sin. But what I'm saying is I'm not saying whether it's a sin or not. But the mantle is not the blood of Christ. It is not a sin. When we are doing dedication, I could have used oil today, which is fantastic. When we are doing ordination, I could have used it. And maybe for some people, it is not a sin. That we have a pot of oil here. We say, anoint yourself for the week. So that everything you step on will turn to good. Maybe it is not a sin. But that oil is not the blood of Jesus. And what I tell people is this. We need to get to a level where people's faith does not need to be propped up. He that has here, let him hear what the Spirit of God is saying. We need to get to a place where people's faith doesn't need to be propped. We need to get to a place where people's faith has to be purely spiritual. For Jesus said that they that worship God, they worship him in spirit and in truth. We need to get to a place where we disabuse having to prop up people's faith. Listen, you can explain it, you can do whatever you like, you can even be justified, but that is not the highway of God. Really think about it. Think about it. Think about it. Let me tell you this. You've just told your son, I've just told him, I'll buy you a shirt tomorrow. And then he says, Daddy, can you write in a piece of paper so that I can keep it in my pocket? I will slap him. You say, say, you, you say that you believe it. I will write on paper to come in so that you have it in your pocket. And then you'll be reading and say, Ah, my daddy is still with me. He's going to buy a shirt. And I don't, are you following what I'm saying? That's the way we deal with God. He said it in the Bible, but it's not sufficient. <laughs> it's not sufficient. You need a witness. Read your Bible. The Holy Spirit is the witness. 
These are deep stuff. Now, you see, when you understand grace, you don't go out there and begin to tear people down. I begin to say, all oh, these people, they are going to hell. No, I didn't say that. No, I didn't say that. I didn't even say he's wrong. No, I've not said any of those. I'm just saying that's not what God has called me to do. If you are here, you are listening to me, you must be ready that your faith become independent between you and God holding the word of God for what he is. Full stop. No addition. No addition. See, God, even God wants to guide you with his sat-nav. <laughs> Amen. And the word of God is the sat now for your life. It can never lead you into the ditch. I can preach with anything. <laughs> Praise God. Look at somebody saying, Christ is enough. We must believe it. Even when somebody is praying for you, somebody is anointing you with your Christ is enough. The, you see, the Bible says, it says, when somebody is sick, let them come to the elders. Let them anoint them with oil. He said, but the oil will heal them. No, he didn't say that. The effectual fervent prayer of the righteous avails much. And somebody say, somebody say, but Pastor, if you were well, do we take holy communion? No, 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 no. Take holy communion. We just enjoy it. It's beautiful. It's an ordinance. It's a, it's a point of thanksgiving. given. Now, in, 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 in the Protestants, now, you see, the, the Holy Communion, for instance, is called Eucharist, which is celebration. That's what it is. But when somebody says, as you drink the blood, then as you drink it, the blood of Jesus is drunk. But you, you know when you come to, to substantiation, have any of you have heard it before? You know what? It's just vinto. That's all it is. Oh, it's just rabbinic. That's all it is. It is not that thing. It's nothing. It's just the environment and the things given for what Christ has done. That's what it is. Not more than that. If we didn't take Holy Communion for the next five years, all of us are going to heaven. Hello? Do you believe it? Are you thinking? Uh, uh, speak? You, you should believe that. All right? So if I, if I decide that, okay, maybe. You know, just leave only coming up for some time so you have time to do more praise worship. And I know some of you are going to think Pastor has passed it. No, I haven't. Believe in the finished work of Christ. If you want to flow in the grace of God, you must believe that Christ is enough. Your uncle is not enough. Your MD is not enough. Your manager is not enough. Your work is not enough. Your career is not enough. Because sometimes we get carried away and we put our faith and energy into career and vocation, into our job, into everything. I told you about the story of a man that said I can never be sacked because I'm so important in my work. Base, the work cannot survive without me. He was right. But what he did not know is that God ruled in the affairs of men. He was not sacked. He was not dismissed. But the company folded up. You should go to work on Monday. Look at some of saying, Christ is enough. Let me finish with David. One minute. No, I've got one other. Okay. David understood this. You'll be wondering how. <laughs> David understood. That if you want to flow in grace and do the impossible, you just need to step out. Step away and let God be in front. Look at somebody who saying, Christ is enough. David understood it. David understood it. You know, I like David. I'm telling you. Oh my God. Maybe I should even change my name. I'm telling you. David understood it. In the Old Testament, David understood the Bible said Goliath stood in front of the people harassing, embarrassing, doing whatever he liked, saying things that he shouldn't say. Why do I know? That's why David used the word defy. Defying the armies of God. Saying what he shouldn't say. Insulting God, saying whatever. Goliath is like somebody telling you, you have been going to church, we have not seen anything. That's a Goliath. 
They defy Christianity, defy the armies of the living God. If anybody tells you, but you have been praying, we can't even see any difference. That's a Goliath. Define Goliaths are like Sambalans and Tobias. Now, what is, is this everything that your God can do? You have been born again now for 15 years. You don't have a house. That's a Goliath. You say you are trusting God. We can't see results. That's a Goliath. Looked at them, he said, Is this every one of you? <laughs> Even your king saw his shoulder eye taller than all of you, but not me. Of you are the same. Rats. He said, If indeed you serve a great God, can somebody not just step forward? Let's prove it. And the Bible said everybody was trembling, including King Saul. Until one boy who is very curious. You see, people who know how to flow in the grace of God, many human beings sometimes think they're arrogant. Because their processing is different from your own. When you are afraid, they are not afraid. But you see, you don't know why they are not afraid. You think they're not afraid because they're stubborn. You think they're not afraid because they're arrogant. But they're not afraid because they know there's no need to fear because they are not the one doing the work. But you consider it arrogance. And so his brother looked at him and said, we know your heart, David. You're a wicked boy. That's what you like to do. Putting your head where they have not called you. David just turned the way that you don't understand grace. Let's talk to somebody else. Because you are calculating. You are calculating the age the military experience, the power of the mixer, uh, the strength of despair, that's what he's looking at. They are looking at the height. I'm just a short boy. I'm only 17. I don't know what I'm doing. The Bible says he's Rudy and handsome. That shows that David was not a tall person. You don't call a tall person Rudy. <laughs> Amen. There are some Rudy people in this place, but some of us are not Rudy. Amen. <laughs> After service, go and find out the Rudy people. Amen. Praise God. The David turned away. But listen, I finish on this. First Samuel 17, 47. Why? David said, Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord is sufficient of himself. The Lord is complete of himself. And God likes to tell people that I, I can do it by myself. And that's why he gives people stupid advice. So that you will know you are not the one doing it. Gideon got at 3,000. God said, I don't want them. After some time, after some time, God said 300. You know why? Is it so that when I finish, I don't want you to think you can do anything. I want you to thoroughly understand. That's why people who are humble enough to be stupid generally see the flow of the power of God. Oh, this, 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 this is deep now. God told the children of Israel, he said, when you want to bring down a wall, you find out to break it down, move in and kill people. He said, no, just sing. Sing out. You know what God was trying to do? God was trying to prove to them that what I want to do, I can. But the only thing I need from you is to obey. And I'm going to get to that next week. Is to obey. I just want you to obey what I say. You don't worry how it's going to happen. Don't calculate it. If you want to flow in the grace, if I say fill the water pot with water, just fill it with water. When you take it to the steward, it's going to be the best wine you have ever tasted in your life. If I want to bless, if I say apply for the job, don't tell me your CV is not good enough. You just apply for the job and that CV, when it gets to the people that matters, it will be the best wine they have ever drank. David knew it. David said, and all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spare. For the battle is the Lord, and it will give you into our hands. It wasn't the spare nor the sword that delivered great victory in life. If you still think your sword and your spear will deliver victory for you, when you face Goliath, you will tremble. Because you will find someone who has a spear that is ten times your own. And you'll find someone who has a sword who is bigger than your own. You'll find someone who is more intelligent than you. And then when you build your life on your own ability, every moment you face people who have greater ability, you will be defeated. But if it's got nothing to do with your ability but the abilities of God, your small ability will be sufficient. God will give you spirit. Yeah, no, no. David still needed a sword. True or false? Yeah. 
my prayer is that God will teach you how to use your spear, how to use your sword without depending on them. Stand on your feet.